Uh, I, read, I read a story this week about a young boy up in Kentucky. He won, he won a Darwin Award. Do you know what a Darwin Award is, anybody? Natural selection. No, no, no. Well, in a way, maybe. Stupid. Bingo. Bingo. Stupid. It is an award given each year to uh, men or women, makes no difference gender-wise, but young or old makes no difference chronologically. Uh, it's given to people uh, in different categories who act and do something that they consider beyond human stupidness. <laughs> If you are one of the stupidest people on the planet and act as such, then you will probably find a Darwin Award in your future sometime. And, Darwin. huh? Spell Darwin. Well, I'm just saying, that's what they call it. Anyway, the Darwin Award went to a young man up in Kentucky this year, a, a teenager, uh, 17 years old who decided, he's, he's actually recovering in the hospital now on life support, after three weeks on life support, severe head injury, and they asked him, he's now you know coming out of it, and they asked him, what did you do? And his answer was, I wanted to see how close I could hold my head to a moving train before it hit me. <laughs> So he went out on the railroad tracks in Kentucky and waited for a big old freighter to come by. You know, they're hauling coal and all that stuff through those tracks up there. And he got closer and closer until suddenly, wham, a hunk of the engine sticking out, nailed him and just about, knocked, about killed him. So having read that in, in the news, the Darwin Committee decided this boy gets the award. <laughs> Why in the world would you want to see how close you could get your head to a moving train before it hits you? I can tell you, right up to the point it hits you. You know, just like the guy that asked, well, if that engine qu cuts out, how far can we fly it? Well, all the way to the crash site. You know? <laughs> what kind of idiot would do that? Well, the same kind that eats Tide Pods, you know. Let's face it, put down the Tide Pod, go for the Little Debbie. <laughs> the millennials. Makes you think it. Anyway, today's scripture, God says, or Jesus says, this is his, one of his final uh, public teachings with his boys before he goes in, of course, to the Last Supper and then the whole crucifixion thing is put into process. But one of the last time, he sits down, and, and you know what? I don't know this for a fact. Total 100% speculation on Tom Channer. But I'll bet he was looking at Peter when he said this. He didn't say Peter. He just said, gentlemen, which one of you, if you were going to start building a house or a tower, he says tower, but a house, would start building it without having first sat down and asked yourself, can I afford this? Do I have enough money for all the materials? Can I get all the materials? Can they be delivered in, in, in time? A timely fashion? You know, I really don't need the roof delivered first. If you don't sit down and think it through, what's going to happen? Well, inevitably, you set yourself up for disaster. And at least ridicule by your neighbors. They're going to come out and say, what are you, what are you, this guy's an idiot. you got three roofs sitting out there and no walls or foundation. And now he hasn't got the money to buy the walls or foundation. And they're going to talk about you. Or which one of you, if you're faced with an enemy of 20,000 and you've only got 10,000, would go out there and say, oh, let's just duke it out and see what happens. You know, Conan would do that. Because that which does not kill you only makes you stronger. Well, I'm here to tell you, 20,000 against 10,000, you're probably going to lose. 
you're probably going to lose badly. So why don't you sit down and think it through? And if you can't overcome the bigger enemy, then be smart enough to send some delegates out there to say, hey, we don't want to scrap with you. All it does is tear up the land, aggravates the farm animals, and gets us all killed. Why don't we figure this out another way? Wouldn't that make more sense? All right, let me ask you all another question. How many of you have ever made a stupid decision? Do you know why you made the stupid decision? Because you didn't think it through. Well, folks, Christians, we who believe in Jesus our Christ and the power of the Almighty God and His love and mercy and compassion, and we take all of that for granted, we do stupid stuff all the time. Because we play by the same rules that the rest of humankind has to play by. We make decisions, we have to live to our decisions. Now, the modern generations, I granted the last one or two, they don't want to accept responsibility for anything. But that doesn't relieve them from that responsibility. Just because they don't acknowledge it or won't accept it. So when a young 16-year-old kid says, I got no money, I'm going to run into the store and shoot somebody and rob them, he doesn't think of the fact that he might get caught, that there's security cameras filming him, they'll know who he is, they'll have every cop in the county looking for him, and if God is merciful at all, they'll catch him and arrest him alive. But more than likely not. And yet they go, he runs into the store, he pulls his gun, he shoots a clerk, he grabs a hand, you know, 40 bucks or something like that. And then they finally get the kid, he tries to fight it out, the cops shoot him down, and of course the media says, oh, the poor little guy never had a chance. Why would you kill such an innocent, nice little boy like that? He sang in the choir for crying out loud. Really? You're going to believe that? But see, that's where our press is. They, 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 see, we've leaped beyond the sublime into the ridiculous. Now we've leaped beyond the ridiculous into the insane. The kid ran into the store, killed an innocent man for 40 bucks. That's like a wild rabid dog. If a wild rabid dog was running around your neighborhood biting children and that stuff, spreading rabies, what would you do? You'd call animal control or else if you had your own gun, you'd go... <laughs> End of problem. Think it through. You know, it sounds so simple, and yes, so few of us do it. You ever had, you know, I just, I, I saw the coolest thing this week. And I didn't even tell Carol, because she's gone. But she needs it. Uh, did you ever wish? How many of you have smartphones? Everybody. How many of you are not as smart as your smartphone? <laughs> How many of you have texting capabilities? How many of you have sent a text you wish you hadn't sent? <laughs> See, that's the problem with the text. Once you send it, boom. And you can't even correct it if the word is misspelled. You know, usually you touch on something or push a button or something and then it comes back up, edit, you know, and you can fix the misspellings. But not with texting. See, texting is like, it's like the age-old adage. Two things you can't bring back is what? The spent arrow and the spoken word. Once you say something, if I'm ugly to Doris here and say, I can't take that back. I can say, oh, I'm sorry, I take that back. But you can't unhear it. That's the problem. That's the way it is with text. You see, once you send it, you can't un they can't unsee it. Well, be of good hope, ye who wander in a sea of darkness. 
Remember this name. Write it down. Marcy Peterson of the District of Columbia has invented a new app for every iPhone or smartphone that makes a difference. Every, a new app called On Second Thought. Good name. And it will give anyone who has texted 60 seconds to take it back. You got 60 seconds before it'll deliver it. Marcy Peterson, and the app is called On Second Thought. I don't know how much it costs. I don't know how to get it or nothing like that because I don't know anything about smartphones. But I thought to myself, wow, what if we had an app that we could like put in our bodies to where I'd have 60 seconds to not say what I said to Jimmy or to not say what I said to Johnny or not say what I said to Paul back there and say, oh, gee, I wish I hadn't said that. How many of you all have ever said, boy, I wish I hadn't said that? You all have. Probably about me. <laughs> well, that would be great if we did have one of those in life, but we don't. This lady's trying to give us a little bit of one. But the fact of the matter is, when we speak, that's forever. When we hurt, like shooting an arrow, that's forever. It's going to find its mark. And it doesn't matter whether you intended it or not. And it doesn't help if you say, well, I take it back. I take it back. All them ugly things I said about you, I take them back. That's what I say to that. Take this back, pal. <laughs> because she can't unhear it. He can't unsee it. The hurt has been caused. And if most of the time it's a question of thinking it through. Do I really want to say that? Now let me ask you one more question. How many of you have ever written a letter or a text angrily in a moment of passion and you were just about to send it and you said, I'll wait a day. Have you ever done that? Oh, I do it all the time. I have my parishioners. <laughs> Carol says, you better not do something. You're going to hurt her. You're going to hurt him. And they're going to kill you. <laughs> He's a lot bigger than you are. Think it through. Sounds so simple, doesn't it? And yet, how many of you have made stupid decisions? You know why? Because you didn't think, think it through. We get all flustered. We get excited, sometimes in a happy way, sometimes in an angry way. And our emotions start going in. The juices are squishing and the squishers are squishing. And we just get furious or we get elated and we do stuff, say stuff. We well, you know there's three kinds of logic in this world. There's illogic, that's when your brain is just chemically screwed up and you can't think, you've lost the ability to reason. And I say, Johnny, we need to buy a new car for the church. Go to the car dealership and get one. And he goes down to Parker Boats and gets this big old beautiful boat. He says, well, the boat was prettier than the car. Johnny, we ain't got a lake, we haven't got any water. We need a car for the church. And you go, what's wrong with him? Well. He's nuts. <laughs> we all know that. That's illogic. We need a car, not a boat. But there's a, another thing that, you know, it's kind of right in the middle, that blurred area we call non-logic. That's usually whooped up by emotions. And that's what gets dangerous. A lot of stupid decisions are made in the realm of non-logic. Caroline needs a new car. She's a new mom. She needs a minivan. No, not a minivan. <laughs> minivan. 
Doors open on both sides, baby sippy cup holders everywhere. <laughs> and enough room to store 3,000 diapers a day. So she goes out and her husband Matt's waiting for her saying, all right, you go, I gotta work, so go get us a minivan. We're a new family, starting, starting our family. She goes down, well she gets to the car lot and of course the salesmen, who we all know are just the most helpful people on the planet, yeah. say, hi there, sweet little darling. Woo, that blonde hair of yours just shining in the sun. I got two words for you, girl, mm, mm. And before you know it, he's bringing out this $150,000 Maserati saying, look at that candy apple red, sharp, short man, lower to the ground, got a T-top roof and the doors open up. You get in there and sit behind that wheel and look at that and woo, you look good. And you know, you start looking in the mirror and going, I do look good. <laughs> So she ends up buying a car they can't afford, they don't need, which does not solve their purpose of a family, and brings it home, and you don't understand why Matt's upset about it. <laughs> Matt doesn't understand why you got ended up with a Maserati and not a minivan. Because I'm not ready to be a frumpy mom, I'm ready to be a Maserati girl. <laughs> That's non-logic. When we act and make decisions that don't make real sense. The fact is they needed a vehicle. Well, I got a vehicle. They are decisions, but they aren't the best decisions. That gets us in more trouble than the illogic. Because if you're nuts, people know it. And they go, ah, he's nuts. Don't worry about it. Then there's logic. What is logic? Well, logic is where Jesus would like his Christian men and women to be. They sit down and they think for a minute, is this a good idea? Will this offend anyone? Is that, you know, should we use that money for this cause rather than this cause? You know, this is the more immediate cause and they're hurting the worst. So these guys we can get to later with some other funds, you know. And you make a decision based on the situation, the circumstance, the resource that you have, the ability and the, the help, the manpower to serve the ministry and the body of Christ in the best possible way. Which of you went out to build a tower wouldn't sit down first of all and ask yourself, do I have enough money to do this? Well, that ain't theology. No, it's not. It's good old, plain old, say it with me, God-given common sense. Use it. Because, see, emotional Christians are very emotional people for the most part. And they let that color their decision-making, which isn't the best decision sometimes. Sometimes the answer's got to be a hard answer. The answer's got to be no. We can't help there. We can't help there. We can help here. And it doesn't mean that I hate you too. It's just that I don't have the resources for you too, but I can help her. But that doesn't mean you two are off the table. We'll figure something out somewhere. Think it through. Secondly, you got to choose the things that matter the most. How many of your parents ever raised children? How many are new parents? <laughs> Where's Vanessa? I'm going to point at her. There she is. You know, I'm going to tell you a verse now that you eventually will dis discover on your own, but I'm just going to say it now. Choose when your kids get to the teenage years, especially girls. First man that ever ripped a phone book in half had a 15 year old daughter. <laughs> when you get to the teenage years, choose your battles carefully. Do you really want to alienate your son or your daughter over the fact the matter they want to get their ears pierced? <coughs> Is 
that worth fighting over? Now, if they want to tattoo a face of me across their chest, yeah. I can understand you letting them do that. But earrings? What are you, nuts? Choose your battles carefully. Choose what matters most. And stick to it. Hold to your boundaries. Kids need boundaries. Bang! They bang up against you in the walls of the boundaries because it helps identify who they are. Well, Christians, God does the same thing. Boom! Boom! Why won't God let me? Boom! Boom! Five times Paul tried to go up into Bianthia and God said no. And the Spirit prevented him. So instead, he decided to go down into Greece and he planted three million churches down there. If he had gone up into the Germanic tribes, he probably would have been killed easily because they're barbaric people up there. Kids need, moms need, and dads need to decide what's the most important battles worth standing up for. And kids need you to hold fast to those barriers. Remember Ted Williams? Anybody remember that name? He's a baseball player. Probably one of the greatest hitters. Some say even better than Babe Ruth. He had a lifetime average of over 400. Career average. Uh, he had an on-base percentage of 483, which is amazing. But he could pound those home runs, pound those home runs. And they couldn't figure out how he knew a ball was going to be a ball. Well, the, the secret was Ted Williams had 2010 vision. He had a remarkable ability to see the strike zone. He had a remarkable ability and focus so clear as to see the angle which the ball was coming in, the vector on which it was coming in. And many times he was criti criticized for not taking a swing at it. He says, why? It's outside the... The reporters once asked him, he said, Ted, wouldn't you get a lot more hits if you swung at some of those balls that were close? You know what his answer was? Then where do you draw the line? The ones outside that strike zone are not important to me. Anything within that strike zone, I'm going to hit. Now, he's no bigger a man than anybody else. He was no stronger. They didn't have all the steroids and that stuff back in those days. Lifetime average. Wow. On base percentage. Wow. He drew the lines. This is what's important. Anything outside those parameters, I don't care. New parents need to know that. New parents need to know not everything is worth fighting about. Oh, I went through that with my two sons. They were wonderful boys, but they challenged me every step of the way. Every step of the way. That's what we do. It's what children do. As they strive, struggle grope to become a man or a woman. Gain their own identity by banging into the identities, the barriers of mom and dad. No must mean no. But make the no on an important matter. Not something that's trivial. Who cares? Think it through and then choose what's most important. I got this little piece here from the Statistic Bureau and this is a, from the, the Association of Psych, uh, Psychiatrists. They tell us that on average, that's all you guys, on average, uh, a human being will 10,000 thoughts will pass through the human brain each day. Wow, how many of you thought 10,000 things yesterday? Okay, and that was just what color to paint your nails, wasn't it? <laughs> that makes for each of you that this week you will process 70,000 thoughts. Ooh. And that'll just be your haircut. Which equals 3.65 million thoughts a year. So by the time your child is one, you will have considered 
five million options. <laughs> That's why your brain cells die. <laughs> <laughs> Children suck the life out of you. <laughs> I'm working here. Do you see me working here? <laughs> but it's ringing home, man. <laughs> The point I'm trying to make is if this is true, and I'm not saying it is or it isn't, they just measured it somehow, we got a lot to deal with. You know, you ever ask your question, hey, what, you're staring off in the distance, what are you thinking? You know what the answer to that is? Who knows? I'm a million miles away thinking about things I don't even know why I'm thinking about. 3.65 million thoughts and this, which most thoughts require a decision. You like it, you don't like it. You're going to do it, you're not going to do it. 3.65 million every year of your life. Whoa. And you, should I spank them for this? Should I spank them at all? Should I eat this? Should I do that? Should I order the double cheesy greasy or get the salad? That's an easy one. Cheesy greasy. Choose your battles carefully. And even that is quite a task in itself when you think about how much you've got to deal with, how many circumstances change. Jesus says Christianity should make sense. Paul said the same thing. He says, you know, all the Jews are preaching, oh, don't, don't eat burgers if the meat was sacrificed to an idol because God will get all mad. Jesus said, God's not going to get all mad. A burger is a burger is a burger. If you're offered a burger, eat the dang burger and be glad. <coughs> it's not going to defile you. It's not going to make you sinful. You're not going to lose eternity for eating a Whopper. McDonald's maybe, but not, no, I'm teasing. Choose your battles carefully. The reason we make stupid decisions is, first of all, we don't think it through, and second of all, 99% of the time we're arguing over something that in the 10 days from now is not going to amount to anything. A hill of beans, i.e. football season. <laughs> we're going to argue all today and tomorrow how this guy played and that guy didn't and that was an unfair call and this and blah, 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 and next week's games, all that goes away. Because you know why? We got new stuff to argue about. Come on. Come on. That's fun if you take it in the humor and the grain of salt that it is. Jesus makes Christianity very practical. No sense getting in a fight with somebody over a team that you don't play on a season that you can't control in a sport that you don't know very little about. That's what makes me crazy about astrologers. Any of you guys astrologers? I hope not. <laughs> well, I can't go out today because Mars is in retrograde and Jupiter is rising and Mercury is, you know, and I feel bad for all those guys whose sign or whatever was Pluto because he's not even a planet anymore. He's just a little chicken nugget out there floating around. <laughs> Are you telling me how these rocks a million, billion, trillion, trillion miles away is affecting your life? Stupid is, says stupid does. A few years ago, 151 West Point cadets were expelled for cheating. Y'all remember that big scandal? Oh, it was horrible. Over 50% of the class of cadets, 151 of them, were found to have cheated on all their exams and sold and bought exams and answers and all of these things. And the reason it was first such a scandal, uh, usually you do something ugly and nobody cares anymore in this world, but it was such a scandal because it had never happened before at West Point. The men who went there were grateful and honored to represent and to serve their countries, and they looked forward to bright and wonderful futures as an American uh, soldier, as an officer. Half the class were expelled, thrown out of the point, 
for cheating. Before they left, they gave each one an exit interview. Each student was required to come before a military tribunal, made up of which two of them were psychiatrists. They were officers, but they were psychiatrists. Their report is 98% of these cadets that were expelled said, when, when asked why would you throw away such a, a promising life and future, they said, I'm not sure why, but I do think taking God from the forefront of our thinking on a daily basis is part of the reason. We've lost our moral center and we're beginning to act like the rest of the world. If you can't get ahead, you cheat. The end justifies the means. Seven years before, they had canceled the requirement of daily chapel, making it mandatory for every cadet. Seven years before. 98% of them said, we, we really don't have a moral compass anymore. God is no longer allowed to be emphasized. Jesus is never mentioned. Wow. Of the 98%, 92% of them were brought up and raised in good Christian families. You know, it's a very stupid thing when you throw God out of your life. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve did that, and it did not work out well. And all the rest of the Bible, as I mentioned, and the Scriptures, and the Savior, and the kings, and the prophets, and the armies, and the wars, right up to Revelation 22, was an attempt by God to correct the decision made in chapter 3 of Genesis. Christianity should be very practical. First for yourself, think it through. Do you really want to blow God off? 99% of the Christians in this world, when they get in trouble, they get into a divorce, or they get into this, or get into that. First thing they do is you, know, you stop seeing them in church. Bad decision. D.L. Moody, and I'll close with this. D.L. Moody, the great father of the Moody Institute in Chicago, evangelism worldwide. He sat down and he said to my seminary class, uh, the seminary class at the time, he said, if I could get someone to sit down and to think about the condition of their individual soul for just 10 minutes, honestly, sincerely, and be, be, be courageous with themselves. I'll bet I could convert them to Jesus Christ. But the trouble is, most of us refuse to, be, to seriously consider anything, even those most important things that matter in our lives. Everybody comes to me when somebody dies and says, well, Tom, I've never really thought about death. How many of us sit around and think about dying, death? Very few. Very few. You know, we don't even refer to it as death or being dead. We've got a million phrases for it. Kick the bucket. Go into the good, big guy upstairs. By the way, God doesn't like to be called the big guy upstairs. We don't like to talk about it, do we? Well, it's inevitable. It could happen to us. It could happen to our children. It could happen to my grandkids, uncles, aunts, good old me, ma, and pop, pop, or whatever you call them. It's inevitable. This is why we have so many shattered and broken and incomplete lives in this world. Because we don't think things through. We don't fight over what really matters. And somewhere along the line, we have blurred that line that used to keep God a priority. 
You know, there's a lot of nice things in this world if you just get out of that little Christian box of yours. You know, it's that little Christian box that protects you from the things of this world. How many homes would be complete if they just thought it through? How many marriages? You know what's getting rarer and rarer these days? 40, 50, 60 years of marriage. That's what's getting rarer because easier to get out. You can get out of a marriage easier than you can get out of a magazine subscription. How many marriages would be saved if we just thought it through and said, really? I know the kids are a mess and the, we have no finances and the house is a wreck and I'm working and I can't find a job. And, but you know, in 30 years, this might all be great. How many relationships would be restored? How many parents and children would be restored? How many young men would not be in a prison cell if they thought about it and said, you know, I don't need that 40 bucks in that grocery store. Maybe I'll get a job and be a bag boy. Then I'll earn my 40 bucks. Rather than pull a gun and take somebody's life. Last, one of the last lessons Jesus taught his boys is stupid is as stupid does. Think it through, people. Consider what's worth fighting for. And if it truly is worth fighting for and you've drawn your lines, then hold to them. Hold to them. Because you need that. The world needs that. The people around you need that. And you need to be fully aware of that. See, the thing about being dead is you don't know you're dead. And yet everybody around you has to deal with it. Well, the same thing is true when we're alive, but stupid. We don't know we're stupid, but everyone around us has to deal with that. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. And so often you don't hear too many sermons from these scriptures because they just not holy enough, but yet there they are. And some of these seemingly unholy scriptures are the ones we need most. So what I would ask you to bless everyone here that we can become good Christian men and women making good, well thought through decisions for ourselves, for our spouses and relationships, for our children. And in the long run, bind our home together within the boundaries and barriers of a moral center a focus who is Jesus Christ our Lord. Then we will have a 40-year marriage, 50-year marriage, 60-year marriage. And so will our children. Bless us, Father, in this effort, I pray to for each one here. In Jesus our Christ, amen.